to officially begin, I am Catherine DeCristofaro. I am a librarian at the Lexington Park Library in St. Mary's County. And tonight we have Sherry Thomas here with us. Uh, Ms. Thomas is a USA Today bestselling author. She decided that her goal in life was to write every kind of book she enjoys reading. And thus far, she has published romance, fantasy, mystery. And um, Sherry, could you say that for me, the W-U-X-I-A? How do you say that? That would be Wuxia. Wuxia. Yeah. Wuxia inspired duology. Her books regularly receive star reviews and best of your honors from trade publications, including such outlets as the New York Times and National Public Radio. She is also a two-time winner of the Romance Writers of America's Rita Award. And uh, Sherry is originally from China and you immigrated here at the age of 13, is that correct? All from your, did I, was that all correct from your bio? That is correct, yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, if it's okay with you, we're going to dive in with our questions. Um, of course. The first thing I want to make sure everyone knows is that, um, Sherry, your newest book, Miss Moriarty, I presume, came out just this past week and is the latest book in That's the Lady correct. Sherlock uh, series. Could you talk a little bit about the Lady Sherlock series in general and um, Miss Moriarty, I presume, in particular, so people know a little bit more about it? Um, well, um, it is uh, it is a six book in the series, and I'm sorry if my reaction time is a little slow because for some reason it just flashed across my uh, screen that my internet connection might be slightly stable. I don't know what that means? Uh, so sometimes when you speak, it cuts in and out a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So if I don't hear um, your question properly, am I asking to repeat yourself? Uh, but uh, I, I think you said you want me to speak a little more about Miss Moriarty, I presume. And about Lady Sherlock in general, just a, a brief overview in case any of our listeners haven't been able to read the series yet. Right, right. Um, the Lady Sherlock series um, has its central conceit. Um, what if the uh, fictional character of Sherlock Holmes was actually um, uh, his adventures and memoirs has actually been, have actually been inspired by um, the lives and deeds of a, a, a real woman named Charlotte Holmes um, and uh, who lived in the exact same um, era um, in the late Victorian um, decades. Um, and uh, so far uh, we have written um, six of these books. Book six have just come out. I've written six of those books, not we. I don't know who else would be writing other than myself. Um, and, uh, and, um, and in this series, uh, I often don't have any particular uh, great idea of uh, what's going to happen in the future of the series. Like I would come to each book even, not quite sure what's going to happen in the book. Um, but one thing I always did know was that I didn't want to um, get rid of my Moriarty too early uh, because I was a big fan of um, the BBC Sherlock in its first few seasons. And I thought the show floundered a little bit when uh, they got rid of Moriarty at the end of season two. And I thought, that's too early. So um, so now we're in episode six of my Sherlock Holmes series, and Moriarty is only actually just coming on stage for the first time as a character, um, as a speaking, acting character. Um, and, um, and what I didn't want was for him to come um, immediately as a great adversary. Um, he's in, in the background of um, the five previous cases in this series, uh, but, but there is still a, a veneer of civility, so to speak. So um, there are things that Charlotte did that he's not completely aware of, and there are things he has done that Charlotte is not completely aware of, but they maintain this veneer that they are not each other's enemies. So I didn't want him to come on board and immediately start being, you know, just a great adversary. So instead, he comes on screen as a, um, as a supplicant, as someone who would like uh, to be a client uh, of Sherlock Holmes, who wants uh, Charlotte to uh, look into his daughter's fate for him because he, he's not quite sure his daughter is doing all right. She is, she lives, she has lived for, you know, a bunch of years in this remote um, community that is, has a bunch of occult practitioners. And uh, he was never quite 
in favor of her being there. And now she, he thinks he might have been dug in by uh, other people in this community. And so he wants Charlotte to go down to Cornwall to take a look. And Charlotte doesn't really want to do anything with a former Moriarty, but she also didn't think she has much of a choice in the matter. So off she went. <laughs> and that is a plot of Miss Moriarty, I presume, or at least that's a premise of it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely more to it. Um, so uh, before we go on, I just, anybody who's listening, if you have not picked up the book yet, uh, go do it. The audio is also wonderful, has a wonderful audiobook reader, and the book is, all of the, the books are just so intricate, intricately plotted um, and so beautifully done. So go put them on hold, buy them from our local bookstores, go do that now. All right, back to questions. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Was there anything in particular that drew you to the idea of writing a female version of the Sherlock Holmes story? Um, it's, uh, the, uh, I've, I've always enjoyed Sherlock Holmes and uh, uh, both the original canon and everybody else's take on it. Uh, but the take on it that uh, first made me say, I want to do this myself, um, was uh, The Beekeeper's Apprentice by um, Laurie R. King, mm -hmm. in which um, uh, Laurie R. King gave Sherlock Holmes a female partner uh, who's much younger to him, but whose mind and temperament is like almost an exact like equivalent of his own. Um, and, uh, and I love that book. I love that series. And I was just so inspired by it. And that was the first time I thought to myself, I would really like to do this because this is so cool what she managed to take, uh, take, take existing characters and add this new person, new perspective, and suddenly, you know, everything's fresh and new. Um, and, uh, but I laid that aside for a while because uh, at that time I had just published a historical romance and I was going to grad school, so I just didn't even have time or the experience to, uh, to write a mystery, I thought. Um, so fast forward a bunch of years, um, the BBC um, Sherlock came out, with the, the one with Benedict Cumberbatch came out. Again, uh, it has such creative uh, uh, vision and such great flair and energy in its first couple of seasons. And when I watched it, I was like, I really want to do this. I thought to myself again, I really want to do this. But at that time, I was more ready to take action. And so I thought, okay, what could I bring to my adaptation that would be new and interesting? I thought, you know, Laurie King already gave Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Holmes a female partner. Uh, the BBC and uh, CBS uh, um, shows already brought uh, um, Sherlock Holmes to 21st century and uh, elementary on uh, CBS even made Watson a woman. And so I thought, well, the only thing left to do is just to make Sherlock Holmes the original character, the, the, the main character, a woman, not give a female partner, not make it, you know, Irene Adler or, um, or Mrs. Hutchinson who solves the crimes, but just Sherlock Holmes, the character. Let's, you know, gender bend the original character. Um, and I Googled around a little bit, it didn't seem to have been done very much. So I thought, let me do this then. <laughs> and and that, is, that, is a, um, that is a premise that um, if you set it in the Victorian times and say, what would happen if someone in the mind and the temperament of Sherlock Holmes has to suddenly face all this constraint that her male counterpart never did, that uh, suddenly a lot of uh, story threads will start flowing from that. So can you talk a little bit about the process of creating your characters and then the stories that they, the, the plots that they go through in each book? I know you mentioned that each book, you don't know what's going to happen um, when you started the first one. You didn't know where it was going to go later. So do your characters develop first, do your plots, or is it sort of a, do they come together at the same time? It's kind of a... Uh, um... A lot of times, uh, a lot of times I will suit a book's, um, a lot of times I will suit a book's character to the, the, the story I want to tell. Like, like I will, I will first have an idea of what kind of story I want to tell and then uh, find the characters to fit those stories. But I think in this case, um, it is actually very much uh, character driven. Uh, in the sense like, of course, Sherlock Holmes is a larger than life character, right? No matter um, what uh, he or she does, um, what, whatever gender version, they're still going to be larger than life characters. That is one. 
Um, and also too, in the writing of these books, um, before I started writing the, these books, I read um, Louise Penny's Inspector Gamache books. And uh, um, for folks who are not familiar with it, it's a um, contemporary um, series set in uh, French Canada. Sometimes it's a police procedure, or sometimes it's like small town murder mysteries. Um, and, uh, and what I found I really enjoy about that series was it's cast the recurring characters. Um, it's, it's, there's a very much a sense of community. And sometimes I don't even really care what, you know, what crime they're gonna detect um, in, that episode, in, that, in that installment. I just want to see how the, other, how the characters are doing, whether the grumpy ones are still grumpy and you know, whether, the, whether the soft ones have grown a spine and things like that. <laughs> um, and uh, so I thought I wanted to do that. I wanted to also uh, create uh, a community for my cast of characters. And, um, and so interestingly enough, because often, uh, well, uh, when you sign contracts for a series, there are deadlines. And often I have to start writing before I have a concrete idea of what's going to be in the book. So then what I do is I first check in with the characters. Okay, so this is where you are at the end of the last book, and this is what happened in the previous book that's affected you. Um, let's see where you are um, physically and emotionally, and what are you doing, and how are you interacting with the other characters? And then I kind of ease a little bit into the plot, go, okay, um, who's dying here? And who did the, <laughs> who did the killing? <laughs> so so it's, it's not exactly character driven, but it's character linked, so to speak. Um, yeah, um, and as for how I uh, plot it out, I'm, I, I don't know, the process is a little mysterious to me sometimes, uh, like, um, like uh, the first three books, the, or the, at least books two and three, um, their ideas came about very much because I had always wanted there to be a romantic subplot. I want there to be, um, you know, in, in, all the, in all the Sherlock Holmes adaptation I've seen, um, ex except, for, um, except for Mary Russell's book, there's rarely an um, exploration of a relationship. Um, like what kind of relationship could uh, someone with a mind and temperament of Sherlock Holmes, like could they hold and maintain and develop? Um, so I always wanted to be a romantic subplot and, um, and and I, but I didn't want uh, my characters to get, get together too easily or too quickly. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have the gentleman be married in the first book. And then in book five, I'm going to have something happen to his marriage. That was the only other thing I know about this book, other this whole, this whole series, besides the fact that I didn't want Moriarty to come out too early, that I wanted something to happen to his marriage in book five. But as, I sat down to write book two. I had no idea what to do about book two. So after writing a kind of, a, you know, not very good exploratory draft, I decided to steal book two's idea. Uh, you know, f steal the idea for book five and use it in book two. So immediately in book two, something happened to his marriage. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, uh, that's much faster progress than I intended. So now in book five, this other thing is going to happen to his marriage. But when it came to writing book three, again, I didn't know what to do. So again, his marriage had to suffer <laughs> to, provide the, to provide the main plot for the, um, for the book. Uh, and then for books four and five, um, I always want to do a heist book. And my, uh, and my uh, critique partner said, you know, that inspector of yours, you should make sure that he has to come to, um, he's kind of a despicable character. You know, you have to make sure that he has to come to Charlotte for help. So then I presented those two ideas to my editor and say, um, do you like them? Uh, she said, she did. So I said, which one should I do first? She said, do the heist first and do the other one later. But that's what happened to books four, four and five. And then book six is, okay, Moriarty really has to come on, come, you know, on page now. So you see how, and, and yet, oddly enough, because I have to look back at the previous book to see what happened between the characters, these books are very, very closely linked, despite me having no idea at the onset what I was going to do for each. So, um, so you can reverse engineer the closeness. You don't have to plan it. You can reverse engineer it. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, 
So speaking of, of this plotting, I've heard authors talk about characters sometimes taking them by surprise. And, and Charlotte is certainly a surprising character at times. Has she ever done anything on the page that you didn't expect um, or act a way that you didn't originally see her acting? Um, I'm not sure Charlotte has... Um... I'm not sure Charlotte has exactly surprised me that way. It's more like the um, secondary characters who have uh, sometimes come on board and really uh, developed a life of their own. Um, for example, um, there's a young gentleman named Mr. Marbleton. Um, we meet Miss Marbleton in book one, and he's like totally a incidental character. And um, in the second uh, and I didn't think, really think I would have any future use of him. Yet in the second book, Mr. Marbleton comes on page and much to my surprise, you know, he and Charlotte's sister began interacting in a way that kind of thrilled Charlotte's sister, Livia. And, um, and that has since developed into a subplot of its own. Um, to take another example, another incidental character in book one, uh, the family groom, the, the groom the family had hired uh, just for the season. Um, he, is, he was the character who in book one helped pass letters between Charlotte and Charlotte's sister after Charlotte uh, became kind of like a social outcast and had to run away from home. Um, and that, I'm not sure I had much more in, in mind for him until in that, in that first book, uh, Charlotte's sister was writing to Charlotte and said about this groom, uh, he's much a much better liar than I expected him to be. <laughs> and for some reason, just that single line intrigued me so much. And then he would later come back and become, you know, a much more significant character than anyone else had anticipated. Um, so yeah, these secondary characters sometimes come on and develop a whole new, um, and or Inspector Treadles for that matter, um, who at first just seems to be, um, the good cop, you know, who's uh, respectful uh, to ladies and a helpful person in general. And then suddenly uh, he was talking to his wife about whether um, extraordinary women will ever be treated the same as extraordinary men. And his wife said, oh, um, the extraordinary will always be treated differently. Uh, what I wonder is whether uh, if ever a not so extraordinary woman will ever be treated the same as a not so extraordinary man. And, and that kind of like began his unraveling because he started wondering, oh, what else has his wife been thinking about, you know, that she's never told him because this, he, you know, he just thought that she was really happy with her life. And it turned out she had, you know, other ambitions in life and, and all that. Uh, um, so, so all those, all those were surprises to me. <laughs> I love your secondary characters. I, I, Livy and um, Mr. Marbleton are some of my favorite parts of your books. So I am glad that they have grown since you first started um, this year. Yeah, yeah, they really came out of nowhere. <laughs> so how did you start writing in general? You, I know in your bio, it said that you have always wanted to write lots of different genres. How did you get started? Oh, um, I wanted to write in lots of different genres after I became um, after I became a professional writer, even, even may I say, um, uh, I didn't really have great writing ambitions as a, uh, as a younger person. Like when I was in fifth grade, I did briefly think to myself, oh, I want to be, um, I want to be a writer of children's literature. Um, and then nothing came of it. You know, I tried to write a few stories and I could never get past like you know, a few pages uh, because I'd be like, huh, don't know what happens next. <laughs> and I would lay them aside and life would go on and I would read books and go to school and, you know, I did not, it did not seem like my life was greatly affected by not being a writer at all. <laughs> so, so there I was, you know, um, I didn't have lots of notebooks under the bed. No, you know, there, there are people who, who, um, who have been writing since they were little um, and, and they have been writing fan fiction since before we had, you know, we, People knew it was called fan fiction, and uh, they've always aspired uh, to being published. And and there I was, kind of just like, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do in life. And uh, I didn't ever get to figure out in the traditional 
way in the sense that um, I got married right after college and became a stay-at-home mom instead. So, um, so, so whatever I was going to do didn't matter now. Um, I had like a bunch of years ahead of me uh, in which I was just going to sit at home. Um, and then one day when my, um, when my firstborn was one half, I took him to the public library and brought back home um, some books as usual. And I brought back a, a historical romance by a author I had enjoyed very much um, in my adolescent years. Um, but that particular book on that particular day disagreed with me very violently. <sighs> so in the space of a single afternoon, uh, by the time my uh, husband came back home that evening, I told him, hey, um, I read this book. I didn't like it, but it's still a bestseller. Um, so I wonder if I could write, um, you know, my own historical romances and maybe make some money sitting at home because, you know, anyway, my, I have a degree in econ and that's like not much use uh, at all um, if you just have an undergrad degree in econ. Um, and uh, shockingly, um, the, more sh the longer time goes by, the more shocking this becomes. Shockingly, he didn't tell me I was out of my mind and I didn't drop this idea. I just, you know, he said, you know, do whatever make you happy. And I just actually started doing whatever made me happy, which was writing. And, and of course, it is so, so, so much easier to say somebody else has written a book that you didn't like than to actually come up sure. with a book that not only you, but other people will also like enough. And this was in the Jurassic age um, before um, self-publishing was really an option. So you basically had to write and then submit to editors and agents and hope somebody would take you on. And it took, for me, it took me eight years uh, before I got my first publishing contract. And it was only after I had published um, a bunch of historical um, romances. And then I went down to write young adult fantasy and then write, went down to write uh, mysteries that I rewrote my bio to say... <laughs> <laughs> she would like to write whatever she likes to read. You know? <laughs> um, do you mind sharing a little bit about your writing process, like from your first idea of a book to the last line, um, in any of your genres that you would feel comfortable talking about? Uh, it is more or less the same process. It is not a very good process. Um, uh, there are um, there are writers who um, outline really well. They sit down and they think about it. They brainstorm and they just basically um, they can come up with a, a great outline. Then all they need to do is follow the outline. I can do all the brainstorming and out outlining I want, um, and I, I did. Um, you know, I honestly tried a fair bit. Uh, near the beginning of my career and only to realize that whatever I brainstorm, whatever I outline, never end up being the final book. <laughs> At some point, I always abandon them to, you know, take the book in a different direction. So I have since given up. So what I need to, so now what I do is, uh, and it used to be, I didn't know how badly my books would go off track. There was one particular book for which I threw away 200,000 words to end up with about a 95,000 word book. <sighs> um, I know, I know, it was terrible. So nowadays I, I stop sooner than that. You know, nowadays I figure out something's not quite right. Uh, like, like for, for example, the current Lady Sherlock, I'm writing Lady Sherlock book number seven, you know, the six has just come out, I'm in the middle of book seven. Um, and I wrote about 30,000 words. Um, all I knew at the beginning of the book was, I want this story to take place on a boat, you know, on a steam, on a steamship, on a yacht or something. Uh, ended up being, uh, well, at least so far it's on a steamship. Um, and, um, and, uh, and so, so, you know, you do some research on a steamship, you have characters talk to each other and you start wondering, uh, is this in enough people for a murder mystery? Okay, bring this person in, bring that person in. And then 20,000 words into the story, I'm like, okay, now I really have to decide who's gonna die here. Um, and, um, and then I was like, okay, now I really have to decide who is going to um, be the person who did it. And so I thought I decided, and then I pulled in another previous a character who had appeared in previous book to investigate, who happened also to be on board to investigate, officially investigate this, uh, this murder. And uh, then I realized, no, none of this is quite right. Like, I didn't want this person to do the investigation, and I'm not exactly happy 
with who I had as the murderer either. So, so, so then I stopped. Then I stopped. I and I started another draft from the beginning, and with with what I've learned about where I do not want the story to go, and so hopefully this current draft I can push it to about sixty thousand before I have to go back to the beginning again to re refigure everything that is not quite right, um, and uh, and so on and so forth, and then uh, and then when I have done a draft. Uh, if, I, if there's time, my editor will look at it first. If there's not enough time, my editor and my critique partner will look at it together. And my critique partner is much, much pickier. And then she will start telling me everything like, okay, the scene uh, has no emotions or it has no descriptions. Um, or, um, you know, um, uh, and, and, and in, for, for example, in the last book, in the last book, she told me, you know, there's, there's not enough color in this book. And I sat there and stared at the screen for like a few minutes before I realized she actually meant literal color. Oh. Like in the descriptions, there's not enough mention of colors. And, and, <laughs> and then so I thought, okay, so that's one more thing to remember. And oh my goodness, it is so much harder than I imagined to add color to a scene because, because I try not to write using too many words. And when you try to be economic, whatever you mention is something people will pay attention to. So if I mention that a dress is red, it had to be, I feel like it should be red for a reason, like either to add a mood or because it's the matter later on to someone. I can't just like say dress is red, walls are blue. You know, <laughs> it is actually much more difficult to add color than I thought it would be. Yeah. So, um, so then, you know, finer tuning at the end. So that is that is my unwieldy process. So. That's, that's amazing. The fact that you don't know where your mysteries are going and then they come out so well plotted is pretty fantastic. Well, yeah, that's that's what I would say. Um, writing is like, it's not like working in marble, one wrong move and your, you know, your the, the arm of your statue hmm. falls off. Um, it's more like clay. You know, if you don't like it, you can crunch back down to a lump and start re, uh, start over. Yeah. Um, so which of your characters have been the most fun to create? And are there any that ever really frustrate you when you're working on them? Which character, uh, you mean characters in this series? Um, I'm sure if you, if you have other characters that you think we should all hear about, please share. <laughs> no, let's, let's confine them, um, to, to this series, if, unless, uh, unless people want to, um, uh, unless the readers want to ask about my, uh, romances or, uh, young adult books. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, in this, in this series, who is the most, uh, I really love Mrs. Watson. Um, uh, Mrs. Watson is a kind of girlfriend slash mother figure I think we all would like to have in our life. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who is, um, who's not perfect in that she has had a past and she's like, you know, she frets and she worries. Um, but she's so warm and so embracing and she sees you. She really sees you um, and uh, she sees all your potentials. Um, and, um, and, and she, she won't like, she doesn't need to like push you hard. She just needs to listen to you for you to feel like you can do everything. I, I was like, I, you know, I have lots of good girlfriends and I feel like, you know, everyone needs uh, Mrs. Watson in their life just to, you know, to laugh with, to cry with, just have fun with. Um, and of course, to be your financial wizard when you, uh, when you need some, <laughs> some help deciding the price of your services. Um, uh, the one character so far who has given me the most trouble has actually been Moriarty. Maybe because it's just, he's the most recent one, but it, I felt like it required a lot of calibration. Um, so that the character is neither too like feverishly scary uh, nor too cartoonishly evil, but still like chilling in a way that you don't want to be entangled. Um, like, you, like the kind of character that make you really grit your teeth when you think about that you have to deal with him um, and will still send a chill down your spine. Um, uh, we have to think about him. So, so that is that was hard to uh, hard to calibrate. Uh, like, I went back and forth over his appearance at the beginning of the book, wondering like, 
you know, is this right? Am I giving him like superhuman <laughs> powers or is this, um, you know, or, or, or is this is what I'm doing okay? And, you know, is he still human? Yeah. So he was actually the one who presented some um, headaches as a writer. So you've done both historical romance and then of course this is a mystery set in a historical time period. What sort of research do you do to make these worlds as authentic as possible? Um, well, uh, having, having written um, in, this, um, in this time period in the 80s, in the 1880s and 1890s for so long, uh, over so many books, uh, there's like a certain like, uh, like baseline knowledge you kind of have, or at least I have a baseline conception of what, what a world I built uh, would look like and, and readers seem to accept that. Um, so then I uh, research for each book as is necessary. Um, and and there are, um, for readers who are like interested, there are, there are some like books of that era you can use for help, uh, especially with uh, Google Books having digitized so many uh, books from that era. For example, um, Mrs. Beaton's um, book of household management is kind of like a bulwark uh, in my research. I consulted for just about every book I use because uh, I want to know uh, what exactly the servants do. Like each, ser if you have a household with servants, you want to know what each servant's duties are. Um, you want to know what kind of like, what's like the upstairs, downstairs culture. Uh, you want to know what foods were in season each month back then. And you want to know the menus of, you know, what people ate, whether it's for like a 40 people dinner party or just like a household of three or four, just having like a plain dinners and, and luncheons. Um, so that kind of like regular daily life, um, it can provide a lot of, and, you know, alongside many, many um, recipes. Uh, but it's, it's very good that I don't have to cook with those recipes because all they say is like this many grams of this, you know, or this, many, this much, any ounces this, that many ounces that, mix it together, put it in a slow oven and bake two hours. And you go like, you know, is there's no, no guide on any troubleshooting or ingredient substitution. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and then, uh, you know, for your basic like poisoning, the Victorians actually great chemists, um, they have books on poisons and their detection that like you can just use like books published in the 1880s. Um, uh, they love to write about everything. Uh, so, so there's almost nothing now about the Victorians that you cannot find out. You want train schedules, you've got train schedules, you want, you know, how they traveled either overland or via boat to India, you have that. Um, so there, there really is, yet, yet some things are still more difficult. For example, um, I want to find out more about what a steamboat, steamship was like, a passenger steamship was like in the 1880s. And, and so far I have not found like, there's enough description, but so far I have not found like a really, like very detailed description of what the cabins are like and, and so on and so forth. I think it's be because maybe like Titanic sucked the air out of everything. Like whenever people want to like, you know, do historical um, uh, luxury passenger uh, steamers, ocean liners, they immediately, you know, do the Titanic. And then there's not as much study into what happened in the previous decades in terms of, you know, what they look like inside and, and all that good stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, what would be advice you could give to somebody who wants to write, especially if they were interested in writing mystery? Uh, every, uh, first of all, um, if my advice sounds weird to you, feel free not to take it. <laughs> um, because, because writing advice, um, there's, there's no such thing as um, one size suits all advice. All any given writers can tell you is what has worked for them. Um, and what will work for them may not work for you because, um, because the way you work is different. The way you need to approach your work is also different. Uh, so for example, um, what I would advise somebody like me is to read as much as possible in the um, in whatever you want to write and to read the best in that genre so you know where to shoot um, um, it, you know uh, what they say um, 
if you sh if you shoot for the star, you know, you, you might not reach the star, but you can might land on the moon. Um, so that's one. Um, and uh, and for example, uh, for for writing this book, for writing my uh, boat book, <laughs> after I abandoned my first draft, um, I went to uh, read um, I went to read Death on the Nile by Agatha Christie, and uh, because that is uh, the one book I can immediately think of uh, that's set on a boat and was done splendidly. Um, and so it was very inspiring to read it, to see how well she put it together, all the, how the timelines, the motives, the people, uh, how it came together. Um, and yet other people, um, I know other authors who deliberately do not read fiction, other people's fiction, when they are drafting their own novels, when they're taking break between novels, they will, they will read. They do not read books in the same genre when they are drafting. Um, and that is, <coughs> So they would not do what I did. And that's totally fine for them because that's what will work for them. Um, so for, for a beginning writer, um, and so for a beginning writer, part of the journey is to figure out what works and what doesn't work for you, um, where, your, where your strength lies. And to, um, so, so that in the end, you work toward your strength to make your strength greater rather than to correct um, some weakness that you know might only reduce a little bit uh, with lots of work. You should develop your strength instead. Um, and remember, books don't have to be perfect for people to enjoy them. Like there are very, I don't know if there are any perfect books. There are very few perfect books. Let's put it this way. Don't want to go by absolutes. There are very few perfect books. And yet most people will still love their imperfect favorites with the passion of a thousand sons. And they will tell you every, they will tell you, oh, uh, it's too long-winded. Oh, it's, uh, the characters are sometimes a little wooden or oh, whatever. But, 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 oh my God, this, this thing is so good. That, that thing is so good. I can't get enough of this. So, you know, it is, it is not uh, the faults that the readers are looking for in a book. They really are looking to enjoy a book. So just, you know, write to your strength uh, and write what you like. No. Uh, so we've already talked about a little bit that you've written across so many genres. Are there any particular that you uh, want to go back to um, or any that you haven't done yet that you would love to try? Um, I often get uh, asked whether I uh, will be writing more uh, romance, particular historical romance, and so far the answer has always been, I would love to, but uh, a good idea hasn't struck yet. Um, maybe I need to do what I uh, do with my uh, mysteries. I just like sign a contract and start writing and force that idea to strike. <laughs> um, and... Uh, um, I, I would love to write more romances. I, I, uh, I think uh, romances by themselves are wonderful and a romance in whatever is, you know, makes any, everything better. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, so yes, I would enjoy uh, writing more romances in the future, just looking for that idea to strike. Um, and I also have a um, young adult book idea that might veer closer to literary fiction than anything I've written so far. And I'm the first person to tell people I've read maybe about two, two literary fiction novels oh. my whole life. <laughs> maybe two. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, the good ones are good enough to leave an impression. So, um, so, and and uh, maybe someday I'll give that a try. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but I'll have to I'll I'll have probably have to uh, write under a pen name for uh, will be the first time uh, in my life I write a book that did not have a uh, uh, happily ever after or even happy for now ending. Oh. You know, so that's like hmm, yeah, pen name for sure. <laughs> um. So can I ask you about your covers? I adore the covers of the Lady Sherlock series. They're so atmospheric. Uh, do you have any say on how they're created? 
Interestingly enough, I have had a lot of say in these covers, much more than I thought I would. <laughs> um, I, 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 I specifically remember the first cover. Um, the first cover, um, the, the, what they call comps, um, I'm not sure what they're short for, uh, comparisons, um, like, uh, like mock-ups, like cover mock-ups uh, mock are called comps. Um, so the initial comp we saw for Lady Charlotte actually isn't that different from the final cover. It's a woman in this reddish dress in front of this slightly sinister looking house. And for some reason, my agent and I were just like, oh, yeah, this, um, it lacks something. Neither of us have any graphic um, design training or background or um, expertise. So all we can say is it's missing something. We don't know what it's missing. And we don't like the font. By the way, can we use this other font? <laughs> so, um, so, so every time they will come back with like, they tweak a little bit and we were like, we still, we still don't like it. We still, or we, should, we still don't love it. We, we still feel it's missing something. Neither of us can say what's missing. And then suddenly one day a new draft came back and instead of Charlotte Holmes just facing a closed door, now the door's open, ajar, with a little light spilling out. And all of a sudden that entire cover came to life. Um, and, uh, and that has been sort of like our subsequent um, journey too. Very often we will, show, will be shown mm -hmm. basically the image of uh, a woman standing against the background and we'll be like, uh, it needs more drama, it needs more movement, it needs more something. Um, and, uh, and then they will go back. And I, I was particularly, I particularly love book three um, in which we have this, this woman walking into a kind of like a, a snowy woods with a, with a, um, with a manor at the, at, at the far side of it. And uh, you can see that, uh, and she's wearing this beautiful cape and the cape is flaring out behind her. It's like full of um, drama and, you know, it's really dynamic. Whereas in the beginning, somebody was just standing in front of the house, you know, very, very meekly, like, like a Amish, <laughs> with like slightly Amish looking um, cover. Um, so um, the only cover for which we were shown a cover and we just said, yes, that's it. So far has been book four. Book four, the, 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 the figure, the woman's figure is static. She's just standing there. Yet behind her is this very intriguing uh, architecture that really draws the eye in. And that make you wonder, oh, is she going to go down it? Is she going to discover something in it? And so, um, so yeah, uh, we've, uh, we've had a lot more um, say in the covers than, uh, I've had a lot more say in the covers than I thought I would. <laughs> um, so are there, is there a mystery or a mystery author that just comes to mind when people ask for recommendations? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, I mean, there are many, but for example, if people want to uh, read books similar to what I write, uh, if they want to read about, um, you know, uh, Lady Sleuth living in historical times, there, um, I can recommend uh, Diana uh, Rayborn with her Veronica Speedwell books. I can recommend, uh, yeah, um, I can re recommend uh, Annalie uh, Hoover um, and, uh, uh, names always escape me. Who wrote the Who wrote the Lady Emily books? Um, oh. Tasha Alexander is it Tasha Alexander who wrote the Lady Emily books? Um, Lady and, Emily uh, Ashton mysteries. Is yes, that? yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they are by. Watch Emma already have it in the chat. Uh, yes, Tasha Alexander. You were Tasha Alexander. So yeah. Um, so there. Um, and uh, and there's uh, also a new series uh, featuring uh, the Bronte the Bronte sisters hmm. as as amateur detectives um, uh, by Bella Ellis. Um, so, um, so there are um, lots of really good uh, lady sleuth, uh, historical lady sleuth books um, to be had right now. And of course, uh, I always want to recommend uh, Laurie R. King series uh, because that's what made me want to write uh, um, the Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes series by Laurie R. King, which is already there uh, in the chat. Um, and, uh, and the uh, full contemporaries, uh, the Insta Inspector Gamache series by Louise Penny. Um, now, because you do write beautiful romance novels as well, are there any romance 
um, authors or books that you just come back to over and over again and want to make everyone read? Yeah, uh, my go-to have, uh, my rereads have always been uh, Laura Kinsale and Judith Ivory, um, who neither of whom unfortunately have been publishing much lately, but uh, their, their older books should still all be available. And I believe uh, Laura Kinsale has done some, um, uh, has done some audio book versions of mm -hmm. her uh, her novels, of which she's really very proud of her per personally. Um, um, so um, Laura Kinsale and uh, Judith Ivory, mm -hmm. those were my uh, inspirations when I were when I was writing historical, especially as a unpublished authors. Oh, I just <laughs> want to write like that. <laughs> so. Lady Sherlock, it's such an atmospheric book. I know you said that your, your critiquing partner will tell you sometimes you need more description, but I can so see it being a show. Um, do, you, do you have like a dream cast if somebody came to you tomorrow and said, we want to turn this into a long running series who you would want to be cast as, a, as Charlotte? I actually am not very good at casting at all That's like right. I like like for me it draws a blank but somebody has recommended um somebody has recommended uh Florence Pugh who has been in quite a few movies recently mm -hmm. she was in Midsummer Midsummer and mm -hmm. she was in the um she's Black Widow sister and she was in um the new uh, Little Women as well and um and and from everything I've seen, she would make an excellent Lady Sherlock, but you know, it's like, um, uh, how to say it? Uh, adaptations of literary works happen at odd, um, on an odd timeline, if they happen at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, like, Mm, uh, Lord, Lord of the Rings was was never adapted for cinema, amazingly enough, until after you know y decades after um, the author had passed away, um, and uh, and even Bridgerton's, uh, which just came out um, last winter, um, I think the original books came out. At least the first book must have come out in the mid '90s. Yeah, like um, twenty years ago. If, if yeah, if if not uh, if not uh, sooner than that, uh, earlier than that. So um, so it's very possible that. The, the person who's going to eventually play uh, play uh, Lady Sherlock uh, is still in grade school somewhere. <laughs> I will crack my fingers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and although, although lately I have thought, ooh, suddenly one day I thought, I knew who I want to play Moriarty, especially if the book is not going to be adapted for a while. Because uh, suddenly one day I, I, was, I was watching uh, Loki, um, the new TV show, and mm -hmm. I was like, Hey, Tom Hiddleston, if you were a little older, would make for a great Moriarty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would watch that for sure. <laughs> um, so if you could pick any author, living or dead, as a mentor or writing partner, who would you, who would you make come to your house? Oh, um, you know, I have suddenly thought of someone. I am going to pick MFK Fisher. I'm not sure whether um, a lot of uh, writers or readers will be very familiar with her work, but, um, oh, I should, I wish I could reach out and grab it, but MFA, um, some of, I love, I love uh, reading about food and um, food anthropology, uh, food memoirs of some of my favorite things uh, to read about and um and Emma F. K. Fisher who wrote in the 30s and 40s and subsequent years also until she passed away uh was actually one of the best writers of food and you know the the personal food memoir I have ever read and uh she wrote it's actually like with great simplicity yet it's both both sensual and searing in the same manner and um uh, I actually don't need her to write with me, but if she'll just cook for herself and uh, I can have whatever she cooks on the side, uh, you know, that should be good enough for me. That sounds like a <laughs> great plan. I know, I know, right? <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that, you know, in this series, you knew you wanted to do a heist and you knew that um, you needed to get one of your characters. He needed to get his comeuppance a little bit. 
Are there any other um, sort of mystery tropes that you really want to make sure you do or any that you just absolutely aren't your favorites to do? Uh, I'm doing a book on a boat, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is sort of like uh, uh, the it's not a locked room mystery, but it's like a closed environment right. mystery, right? Um, so, um, and and book five actually was kind of slightly, maybe you could call it a locked room mystery, but it's yeah. like a, a, a twist on it. Uh, so, so yeah, what 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 other um, what other mystery tropes are there? There are so many that I enjoy, um, but uh, yeah, I will will. Like, like I said, I never have any real idea what's going to happen mm -hmm. in the future, right? So, so we'll, when I finish book seven, I have to start uh, <laughs> casting around for an idea for book eight. I will, uh, maybe I'll go to like uh, where they list all the tropes and see what, <laughs> what I can pick for my next book. Uh, is, uh, is Charlotte ever going to be accused of a crime? I have thought of that from the very beginning. I have thought of that from the very beginning. That would be very interesting to see how she handles it and, and how she farms out her uh, team basically to do the investigation for her. Um, that's, that's always been an idea at the back of my head, but I didn't want to like use it too soon. I, like, you know, I was thinking more like when it comes to like the pivotal um, part of the pivotal struggle between her and Moriarty, that's when he'll probably pull something like that. Um, but uh, let's see, let's see uh, whether that happens. So I always like to ask um, my authors, what is the last book that made you join the Bad Decision Book Club? Or in other words, the book that made you stay up way too late and you just could not put down because it was so good? Um, I don't know if it did that for me, but... Um, but there's a book that I always want more people to read because I'm not sure I've ever met anyone who's read it. Read it. Um, it's one of those instances where um, it's written by a very well-known author, but outside what she's well-known for. So, um, so it's written by Kristen Kishor, and uh, who is very well-known for her um, Graceling books, books set in, the, in, in that... Um, in that fantasy world, um, and yet she has written a uh, a contemporary choose your own adventure book. Mm -hmm. Have yeah. you read it? Uh, it's one of my favorite books in the entire Jane, world. Jane, Jane Unlimited. You have read Jane Unlimited? Oh I my have goodness. read it multiple times, and it's like an ultimate comfort read. I adore that book. I I I picked up that book because it sounded interesting and mm -hmm. weird and usually I don't go for weird stuff but occasionally I was like you know uh, she's a she's a very good writer um so I thought I'll give that a try like I didn't I, I like but didn't love the Graceland books mm -hmm. but she's she's, a, she's an excellent writer I thought I'll give this a try and it's one of those books that at various points I wanted to set it down because because especially, uh, you, you know what I talk about the, the episode in the library when everything like just basically went up in flames. I was like, what the yeah. heck is yeah. this? I had, to, you know, I had to walk away because it was just yeah, yeah. much for a little so, bit. <laughs> um, so so, so most, mostly throughout this book, it was kind of like, I wonder where she's going with this next. It wasn't as if I loved it. I just wanted to see where it was, she was going with it next. Mm -hmm. And then I fell absolutely in love within the last two pages. Yeah. And the whole book made sense. It, it almost never worked like that. Things in life almost never work like that. If you don't like something by, you know, 30%, if you haven't fallen in love by 70%, you're going to go away from it still not in love. Right. But that book managed to do it. Within the last few pages, I was like, oh, I can't believe what she did here. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. And I'm so glad I finally met someone else who has read it. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many people I've been like, please read this so we can discuss it. I need to talk about this with someone. <laughs> oh. So everybody listening, go read Jane <laughs> so that you can yes, talk to yes. me and Cherry Thomas about it. Right, right. Because it's really quite amazing. Like the, in the end, I wonder, I wonder how many people are like, you know, almost gave up on this book and didn't make it to the end. Uh, yeah. so I was like, ah. Oh. You know, somebody is, I, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I, you know, 
that I met you and you have read it and loved it and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, ah. Oh. Because as soon as you <laughs> finish it, you, you want to start it over and, and go back because you understand everything now. Ah, oh, yes. So. Uh, oh. Well, that just made my night. <laughs> <laughs> it, it made my night too. Do you mind sticking around in case anybody in our audience has some questions? Would you have no, time no, for? No, 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 not at all, not at all. Oh, yeah, sure, let's go to, if, if they have questions, yeah. So if anybody does, if you would go ahead and put them in our Q&A box, um, then we'll be able to see them and ask and ask the questions that are in there. Um, and if not, that's okay too. It's been so lovely having a chance to talk with you. I, I, I'm just gonna have to and, go back and, and, and about Jane Unlimited, no lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna have to go make sure I check out all of the books of yours that I haven't read yet. I've mostly read the, the Lady Sherlock, but I, I've had, um, Oh shoot, I'm gonna miss up the title. The that I'm so terrible at titles off the top of my head, and now I'm gonna feel like a goof that the um Ravishing the Heiress. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I've had more, I've had like five people recommend that to me in the last month. So I was like, all right, I just need to go and, and read that one. <laughs> that is a very angsty book. Yes. I, yes, uh, yes, that's what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> And we might just not have any questions. Sherry, you have been just an absolute delight to talk to. And I thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I enjoy myself so much. It was really lovely to talk to you. And thank you, everybody, um, for um, uh, attending this uh, talk. And thank you for being library patrons. And thank you, and Emma, of course, for being wonderful librarians. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. I will. Thank you very much.